Amen. Thank you, Celebration Choir. That was absolutely phenomenal. All right. That was wonderful. And thank you, Sound Team, for the wonderful job you guys do each and every week. It's like being an offensive lineman. It's like being an offensive lineman. The only time anybody knows is when you keep on for horse. Want to uh, and thank you, uh, praise team, for leading us in worship this morning. Campbell Choir, I can hear you through the walls. Sounded beautiful. Uh, just absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank God for each and every person in this church that contributes something. And uh, of course, we just did our offering. I hope every one of you took an opportunity to contribute something. Some can do more than others, but we all should do something. And uh, a lot of people last night uh, joined with the Divinely Diversified Sunday School class and the 100th Anniversary Committee to put on a fall festival. And man, was it great. And I just want to tell you, thank you for the hard work you did. It was wonderful. It was a great night. Had the bouncers, had the hayride, had the games, had the cakewalks, uh, had it all. It was great. So thank you for all the hard work you put into it. And uh, yeah, you deserve a round of applause. And as with anything else, we really just praise the Lord for what he did last night. There's a lot of people that don't necessarily have a relationship with our church got a chance to come and see Casey and see the you know, nice people for the most part. So that was nice. So thank you for the hard work you put into that. And um, today we will continue what we started last week, and we may finish it. We may not. Uh, we got a lot going on today. But uh, on the topic of faith, faith, putting your trust in Christ, putting your, tr your trust in God, putting your trust in something, faith. And, of course, we say, let's put our trust in God. The story is told of a young girl who was blind and she was trapped on, in a burning building in, in Harlem in New York City and she was on I guess the fourth floor fifth floor she was in a bad spot and she was at the ledge and the firemen were exasperated because they couldn't get the truck into that area they couldn't get the ladder up to her and they were and this is a long time ago I, I not very seriously do this today but they had a big net and they were saying jump into the net and um, she wasn't jumping nobody and she she you know she was scared and she wouldn't jump. And they were getting frustrated about the situation. And finally, the little girl's daddy arrived and they gave him the bullhorn. And he yelled up and said, Honey, jump at my command. And he gave the command and she jumped. She landed in the middle of the net. She fell just limply through the air. She didn't break a bone. She didn't pull a muscle because she was so relaxed that she hit that net because her confidence was in her daddy. She knew that she could trust her daddy. And similarly as Christians, we know that we have a heavenly father who we can trust. If we'll listen to his voice, if we will find, follow him at times with even blind faith, we can make it through life's most difficult circumstances as we develop authentic faith. Last week we talked about two kinds of faith, circumstantial faith and eternal faith. Circumstantial faith is faith that's built on the sand. Circumstantial faith is faith is faith that's based on feelings and events that come our way. Well, he's talking to me. I'm not going to church anymore. That's circumstantial faith. You're not here for, for anybody the way they talk to you, and hopefully everybody's been nice to you today. But there's a chance someone might give you a dirty look or not talk to you. He didn't talk to me. Well, it's hard to talk to everybody. There's three or four hundred people in this room. Circumstantial faith is, I give up. God must be dead. They didn't talk to me at church today. They weren't friendly. Circumstantial faith is based on feelings and events. Eternal faith is faith that's built on the rock, the rock of Christ Jesus, the rock of the Word of God. It's based on God's Word. We take God at His Word, even when we don't feel good, even when things are going in the wrong direction, even when our life is a mess. We trust God. And I can tell you, there are folks in this building this morning, if you don't know it, let me just let you know, they're hurting. They're hurting really, really bad because they've had a bad week. Others have had a bad year. We have folks in our church who are dying of cancer right now, many of which aren't here, obviously. We have folks that are at home that supported this church for 50 years. They're home down this morning. They'll get to see this on TV on Friday night. But they're hurting. They're suffering. All they've got is God's promise. 
others who've had tragedy and crisis come into their life this week. And as we say a lot of times, if it didn't happen to you this week, you know what? There's a good chance it might this next week. So this is for you. Authentic faith. Eternal faith. Unchanging faith based on the Word of God. And let's turn in our Bibles in the Word of God to Proverbs chapter 3. And today we're going to move along and talk about how. How do you develop an authentic faith? How to develop a faith that will get you through the tough times. Proverbs chapter 3 is going to show us that abundant life is based on authentic faith. Jesus Christ told us, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. I've come to give you life and that to the fullest. Charles Stanley wrote a book called The The Wonderful Holy Spirit Filled Life. Wonderful book. And he teaches on that subject frequently. Having a, a wonderful relationship with Christ where your faith is so strong, the Holy Spirit's living through you. You see, abundant living is dependent on authentic faith. And if abundant living is impossible without authentic faith, then it is crucial that each and every one of us walk out of here with authentic faith. And the question we'll ask ourselves to start this morning, right now, taking a good hard look in the mirror and, and asking the tough questions right off the bat is this. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to develop authentic faith? Are you? Some days I'm not. Because when the hard times come, I want to run. When the, when, when, when the checkbook is a little shorter than the bills that come in, well, that's hard. When the difficult news hits, it's difficult. It, 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 it makes you really dig deep and think, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? Do I really have authentic faith? And really this morning the question, that was last week, but the question this morning is, am I willing to do what it takes to develop authentic faith? Whatever is necessary. You see, the highway to health and strength is paved with obedience and faith. We're going to look at verses 5 through 8 and, and expose those this morning, but let's look at the first four verses of Proverbs 3, and we'll see that message very, very quickly as we give a little background for what we're going to be studying. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my command. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. This is the Old Testament version of what Jesus Christ called the abundant Christian life or what Jesus talked about in John 10, 10. Jesus never actually said the abundant Christian life did. Verse 2, for length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in sight of God and man. That is a blessed life. That's what we're all after. So this morning, ask yourself this question. Am I do, doing, am I living a life that, that is, is, is my life marked by remembering his law, keeping his command? Am I, do I have peace? Have I forsaken, forsaken mercy and truth? Have I, do I have favor in the sight of God and man? This morning, you know, it, that, that's a pretty high order. That's asking a lot of a person, isn't it? Today, I, I want to say again, the highway to health and strength is paved with obedience and faith. Our job is to do what we can do and to have faith. Maybe not in that order. To have faith and to do what we can do. His job is to do what only he can do and to reward our faith. Do you remember Hebrews 11, 6? God will reward those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's all about faith, not your performance. Faith, putting your trust in God. Let me give you the evangelical dictionary theology's definition of faith. It's a little more expanded. Faith is the gospel call of men and women to trust in God through Christ. It is trustful reliance on God. The nature of faith is to live by the truth it receives. Faith, resting on God's promise, gives thanks for God's grace by working for God's glory. You remember the book of James? Faith without works is dead. Faith will change your life. Real faith, authentic faith, changes a person. Faith is resting, trusting, and hoping in God. Faith is cleaving to and waiting for God. Faith is believing that I can, but God can. In April, when she was baptized this morning, we we reminded her, Philippians 4.13, many of you have it memorized already, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, here's the thing. We can't just do whatever we want. We should not take that verse and tell our kids, you can do anything and whatever you feel like doing. No. That's the world's way of thinking. That's not faith. Faith says, whatever God's plan for your life, he will in, enable you and give you the power, the ability to accomplish everything. If it's his desire, if you be an astronaut, it's going to happen. 
who was never God's desire for me to get an SBC. And if I had tried as hard as I could, I probably wouldn't have attained that. It was not his will for my life. We can't take verses out of context and just say, oh, everybody's going to be rich, everybody's going to be a millionaire. Well, that's just not true. It's, faith says, God has a plan for my life. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to rely on him. I'm going to believe. Even though I can't, he can. And we should be developing authentic faith in our lives. So, let's read these verses and derive some principles from Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, verse 5. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health in your flesh and strength to your bones. Now these are verses that many of us have committed to memory. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 should be required memorization for every single kid in our church and every parent to teach their children. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. This is authentic faith. This is taking God and his word and living the, the, with eternal faith. Because we know that the circumstantial faith is not going to prop us up when the hard times hit. We need authentic faith. We must develop authentic faith. So let's look at some principles. I have seven principles. Um, maybe we'll get all three today from this passage that tell us how we can develop authentic faith. Principle number one. Trust Christ completely. Trust Christ completely. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust Him completely. Now, the Hebrew word trust is, is, is saying, trust Him for security. Trust Him for everything. With all of your heart. Like a little child looks up to his daddy and trust him completely. Trust the Lord. Trust Christ completely. You know, I reached out for a book the other day. I was sitting in my, my desk and I had my computer in front of me and we laid out three, five or six books. And I, and I, I want to see that book. The second I realized I didn't see that book, I knew where it was. It was behind the computer screen. I was blinded to it. And I reached over there in faith and grabbed the book. I knew it was there. Even though I couldn't see it, I knew it was there because I set it down a little bit earlier. You know, we trust ourselves. We trust our abilities and our careers and our jobs and so forth. We have to trust God who we do not see way more. We know he's there. We, and I knew it was there, and I grabbed it, and I used it. Even though I couldn't see it, I trusted it was there. And we're to trust the Lord and not ourselves for our success, our prosperity, our peace, our well-being. We trust Him, even though we can't see Him. We must totally rely on Him. And it says, with all our heart. This expression calls for absolute obedience and surrender in every area of life. Now, we need to go no further, really. There's a question you can ask. Am I absolutely trusting the Lord in every area of my life this morning? The, the, the call is for a trust characterized by total total commitment. What's the difference between a, a, a rec basketball player or a, a, a recreational athlete and an Olympian? Total commitment. Total commitment. There's not one person in the Olympics that they were, every one of them were totally committed. We should be that committed to faith. We should want to go all the way, trusting him more than we trust our pocketbook, trusting him more than we trust, trust our, our checkbook, and certainly more than we trust those devil credit cards that get us in so much trouble. We trust him more than that. We trust him more than we trust each other. We trust him more than we trust our own parents, our, our own spouse. He knows what's best. We trust him completely. He's going to take care of us. And we trust him more than our feelings. Our feelings will betray us. We trust him more than our feelings. That takes us to principle number two. If you want to develop authentic faith, you must doubt your feelings. It says in verse 5, the second part, lean not on your own understanding. We really don't know it all, do we? Instead of doubting God's promises, you should doubt your own fears and your own feelings. You know, I feel hungry almost all the time. I feel hungry right now. And I had a good breakfast. I could eat 10 meals a day easily. I can't trust my feelings, can I? 
I feel like sleeping in almost every day of the week. You may too. You can't trust your feelings, can you? You've got to do what you've got to do. I felt like punching someone in the nose the other day. I really did. I didn't do it. I didn't just go with my impulse there. God has made promises us to us. Promises that far outweigh our feelings. God promised he'd save us. And we talked about some of these promises last week. Let's review a few of them. He promised he'd save us in Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we go back to trusting Christ completely. There may be someone here today who has not received salvation. You've not had your sins forgiven. You need to trust Christ completely and and quit trusting your own feelings on maybe, well, if I work real good, you know, the Lord's going to kind of put a balance up there and my good deeds are going to outweigh my bad deeds. Probably not. But I feel sad for people that are relying on that because that's not in the Bible. So doubt your, doubt your feelings on that. Trust Christ for salvation. Have your sins forgiven today. What's another promise? Well, he promised he'd prosper us and give us success. Joshua 1 eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou shalt observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way, thy way prosper, and then thou shalt have good success. And that's the old King James for you right there. Prosperity and success are at your fingertips. Trusting, obeying, assimilating, living out the word of God. It's a conditional promise, but it's a promise nonetheless. He promises he'd never leave us or forsake us in Hebrews 13, 5. He promises he'd give us courage in, in Isaiah 41, 10. He promised he'd take us to heaven in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You know the rest of it. These are promises. Now, why do we have such a hard time cashing in on God's promises? Why do we walk around long in the face and blue and discouraged? Because we are trusting our feelings. We we feel discouraged. If somebody in this room this morning doesn't feel saved, please don't raise your hand. You're saved. You gave your heart to Jesus a long time ago. Your sins are forgiven. You're saved. Don't let your flesh make you doubt that. If Christ saved you, you're saved. Nobody can take it away from you. Somebody this morning feels like a loser. You just feel like, man, my life doesn't make sense. Claim Joshua 1 8. Claim Isaiah 41 10. God will strengthen you. He will prosper you. He will give you everything you need. Claim Philippians 4 13. Believe it. Don't believe the way you feel. Trusting God's promises more than the way you feel. You get to choose between doubting God's promises or doubting your feelings. Doubt. The greatness of our fear shows the littleness of our faith. Doubt turns into fear. Fear just turns into control. Fear controls you. It grips you. It makes you never witness, even though you know you should. It makes you, boy, I'm not going to say anything to my wife because she knows, she knows every way I've blown it. I'm not going to try to be a spiritual leader in my home because she knows what a bum I've been. Fear. The greatest of our fear shows us the littleness of our faith. Fear of death. I mean, really. Nobody wants, I don't want to die. I want to live. I'm afraid of death to a certain extent, even though I have assurance of heaven and so forth. Fear, fear, fear of loss, fear of losing your job, fear of, of, of losing control or being rejected, fear of the unknown, fear of the future. Man, there's so many things to fear. And because we let fear move in instead of faith, we're controlled by that fear. And, we're, and we're, we are giving in. We're trusting our feelings. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions who questions who believes. Faith answers, I. We are to be confident in the Lord and not in our own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. Now, on one hand, God has given us good horse sense, good common sense. Saved or lost, Christian or not. We come into the kingdom, we're saved, the Holy Spirit is loved us. He's going to give us some good godly understanding. And as you mature in your faith, you're going to have understanding in a spiritual sense, in, in, in the sense of wisdom and so forth. But we're talking about a natural form of understanding based on what makes sense to our flesh. That's the understanding we're not to lean on. This human understanding undermines faith. So, you want authentic faith? Here's how you get it. Trust Christ completely. Doubt your feelings. Principle number three, we must acknowledge his lordship in every area of our life. And this is huge. 
acknowledge his lordship. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. How do we do that? What does that mean? Well, a lot of people are more than happy to come to Christ as Savior, but so precious few want him to be Lord, Master. There's a lot of cults out there that are teaching, you know, Jesus was a great guy. He, only, he was lying about the whole God thing, but he was a great guy. Well, read the book of Colossians chapter 1. Read Hebrews 1. Jesus was God. He's Lord. He's Master. Have you ever been overlooked? Have you? <laughs> I have. And, and some people seem to be the story of their lives, and, and you know, it's sad. But have you ever been overlooked for something you were, were qualified for? A job? Maybe a promotion? Maybe a team? You got cut. You didn't get the respect you deserved, but some sort of position? It doesn't feel good to be overlooked, does it? None of us like that. How must it make God feel when we overlook Him? We don't even acknowledge Him as we make plans, as we choose the way we're going to live our lives, as we choose the, the, the important decisions in life. We completely ignore Him. We often do that, and it's wrong. You know, Michael Jordan was ignored by two teams in the 1983 NBA draft. And they're still kicking themselves for it. The Chicago Bulls had no idea what a talent he would become. They just said, we'll give him a try. Let's see what he can do. We'll give him a chance. He certainly earned a, you know, earned that by being on, on a national championship team with North Carolina and so forth. He's a capable basketball player. Let's give him a shot. Eventually, he proved that he was more than worthy of, it, of their trust, didn't he? He proved that they made a good decision. And in the same way, God in heaven is infinitely more worthy of our trust. We must acknowledge that. We're fools not to acknowledge that, but we do at times. And we must acknowledge him as much more than just an advisor, one of many advisors in our life. No, he's Lord. He's Master. He's God. He wants to be our Savior and Lord. The old saying goes, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I came to grips with this about 12 years ago when I was in college. I was saved as a little boy, but i got to tell you, when I was in college is when I finally realized and did my own little study on Christ's deity. I had always said I believed that, and I guess I did, but I'll tell you one thing. When you come to grips with the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, he's master, he makes the rules, we say, yes, sir. He says, jump, we say, how high. And, and there's so much blessing, there's so much prosperity that goes along with that, it's just unreal. And there's nothing but failure and hurt and heartache that goes along with us acknowledging only our opinions and our desires and our plans. Trust Jesus completely. Doubt your feelings. Acknowledge his lordship. And lastly for today, we'll finish these next week. Verse 6 closes by telling us we must follow his directions. Follow his directions. He earned it. We're acknowledging him as lord. So now follow his directions. His plan is better than our plan. He will direct your paths. Your translation might say, he will make your paths straight. Literally, it's saying, he will smooth out the path in front of you. Follow his directions. For him to direct our paths, we must be willing to get up and walk. Is that not true? You can't follow the Lord sitting down unless he said sit down. <laughs> it's kind of like having a lantern. This is not a big floodlight. This isn't one of those spotlights like the police have that can shoot all the way down the street. This is just a lantern. The Holy Spirit, our comforter, our guide, God, the person of the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. And he gives us just a lantern, and it sheds a little light just about a day at a time. Sometimes an hour at a time is all we can handle. And he guides us. He grabs us by the hand. He comforts us. He directs us. He will straighten our paths. Now, that's God's sovereignty at work there. I mean, can you imagine being on a path and ooh, it just straightens out in front of you? Only God can do that. The famous missionary Hudson Taylor sailed on a boat on his first trip to China, and they were relying in that day on, on big sails and so forth. There was no wind. There was just the current. And the current was pushing them over towards an island. And the captain and his crew knew that island is full of cannibals. Their lives were in jeopardy. It was a, a, a dead, calm day. And they're just getting a little closer and a little closer to the island. And the captain requested, because he knew Hudson Taylor was a religious missionary or whatever, would you please pray for wind? And Hudson Taylor responded, I will. 
provided you set your sails to catch the breeze. Well, the captain was kind of put out by that. If he didn't want to be humiliated and embarrassed in front of all his crew for putting up sails on, on a day where it was just dead calm. So nothing happened. Finally, the captain relented and put up the sails. And then Hudson Taylor prayed. And God sent wind and rescued them. The ship was within a couple hundred yards of running ashore when that wind pulled and caught those sails and redirected their path. God sovereignly smoothed out their path because of faith. Faith doesn't say, oh, God, give me wind. Faith says, oh, God, give me wind as I put up the sails. An example of that would be faith doesn't say, oh, God, help me to give money to his tithe to obey you there, even though I'm broke. Faith says, I'm going to tithe, I'm going to do what's right, and watch God bless me. Put up those sails and watch him bless you. That's authentic faith, following God's direction, even when it doesn't feel right. Our faith in God is it, based on small acts of obedience, which he blesses. Small faith. Jesus said the faith of a mustard seed could move mountains. Great and mighty things are at your disposal through faith. Authentic faith. Everyone, I believe, is following something. Everyone's following something. Why not follow Christ? Why not follow his direction? He's trustworthy. We are wise to follow the directions he's outlined right here in this book. All the answers we need are right here. And by the way, MapQuest, I have found, doesn't always give you good directions. I hope the map quest people don't get on us. I'm sure it does sometimes, but every time I use it, I end up in some bad neighborhood. I don't trust map quest anymore. God's word will never, ever, ever, ever steer you wrong, even when it doesn't make sense. Don't trust your own understanding. Trust his understanding. Don't trust your own human map. Trust God's map, the word that he's given you for your career, for your education, for your children's education for the difficult choices, for your marriage, for whether or not you get married, for your ministry, to the, for the discipline of your kids, for your home, for your future. It's applicable to every area of life. Follow his direction and watch him bless your life. Next week we'll, we'll discuss the last principles. But let's review. You want authentic faith? It starts by trusting Christ completely. This morning, you may need to give your heart to Jesus. I suspect there's folks in here that have been grappling with this from the very beginning. Do I really belong to Jesus? Have my sins been forgiven? Look, don't question that. And it's not a matter of joining our church or joining some religion or, or, or jumping through certain hoops or going through some ritual. It's a matter of giving your heart to Jesus, trusting him completely, admitting, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. I need the, the, He shed his blood for you 2,000 years ago on the cross. He died, was, was buried, and rose from the grave. He's the only religious leader that ever did that. He'll save you. But for those of us that are saved this morning, do you trust him completely? Do you really? So few Christians do. Today, you want to make a you want to make a change. You want to embrace abundant living. You do that by developing authentic faith, trusting him in every aspect of your life. Whatever happens, if everything falls apart and goes down the tube, I trust Jesus. Whatever God says, that's what I'll do because I trust Jesus. If that means my kids are going to be called to be a missionary to Africa, great. Isn't it great? If, if, if God asked me to sell everything I have and pay off the rest of that building over there, great. Whatever it is, those are extreme things. I want to embrace abundant living by developing authentic faith. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Today you need, they need to commit to developing an authentic faith by targeting one or more of these areas. Christian, do you trust Christ completely? Do you doubt your fear, fears instead of... Uh, in, in, instead? of doubting God's promises. We all do that, don't we? Have you acknowledged his lordship in your life? Today may be the day where you need to say, you know, I'm sorry of living, I'm tired of living a weak, pathetic Christian ex existence. Jesus Christ really is Lord. And I would acknowledge that. Take advantage of this time of invitation. Follow his directions. It's just that simple. There are folks that call themselves Christians that, yeah, they love Jesus, they know the Lord, but they've not been following God's direction in their life. 
It's just that simple. And, and it's as simple as coming and saying, oh, God, I repent. And that takes humility. You can do that right there in your, in your pew, and I suggest you do. Or you can really go forward with it and say, oh, God, I repent. And you know, there's handbells in the way and all that stuff. Who cares? There's plenty of room up for, here for you if God's working in your heart and you need to make a decision today. Would you pray with me? As we close our service off, and we'll, we'll get the rest of these principles next week. I wonder, I wonder if there's one person in here, and if there was just one, it'd be worth bringing it up, and I bet there's more. You are not 100% for sure that Jesus Christ lives in your heart. You need to invite the Lord Christ into your heart today. You need to have your sins forgiven. And I don't want to make it any harder than necessary. You can do that right where you're seated. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Believe that he died on the cross for you. Invite Christ into your life this morning. But if you're serious about it, and I know folks have done that recently, that haven't gone public. I want to suggest you come up here and you make your public profession say. Go ahead and request, that, request baptism while you're at it. Don't let anything distract you in the quietness of this moment. Where you are, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you need to trust, trust Christ for your salvation this morning, do it. Come forward. Make a decision. As the invitation is given and as the, as the piano plays, Christian, you're not trusting Christ the way you should. You've been giving in to your feelings. You have a burden on your heart. You want to just acknowledge Christ's lordship in your life. You want him to be the master of your life, not just the Lord. Why don't you come forward? Make a public profession of that. If you, if, if you need to come and request membership or baptism and all that, the altar's open. Would you stand as we pray? Stand with me. Lord, I love you, and I just thank you for the privilege that it is to meet in your house. I thank you for the privilege that it is to know you personally. And Lord, my heart is burdened for that one that doesn't know you personally, that won't let go. They're, he's holding on to his way. She's holding on to her feelings. Lord, I pray that they would have the courage to come forward this morning and let someone who loves them pray with them and lead them to Christ. Lord, I pray for that Christian whose faith is weak, who one of these principles they need to make a decision about. Lord, I pray that they do so today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The altar is open. Come forward as the Holy Spirit leads you.